I am Rebecca, I'm the editor of Car Dealer. Um, and we're now going to be talking about how custom service can help you sell more cars. Um, we all know that the role of the car dealer is changing. Showrooms are moving towards geniuses rather than salespeople. But what we want to know from our panel is does this really work? So please put your hands together for my panel. Hello, everyone. So um, to my left, I've got Russell Danks, who is from the Future Factory London. Uh, he makes predictions about the future of the market based on current trends. Um, in the middle, we've got Professor Jim Saker from Loughborough University, who runs the automotive management course there. And finally, on the end, we've got Ken Savage from Perry's. He's the chairman, and you're also a non-executive director of the NFDA. Is that correct? Well done. <laughs> um, so let's go straight into it. Is there still a place for the traditional salesperson that consumers imagine a car dealer is in their head? Anyone can jump in. I'll, I'll kick off then. Um, I think uh, the obvious thing is to say yes. I mean, um, we, we, we've tried fixed price sales and it's certainly in, in our experience, it's never worked. Um, a, a, a car. Don't forget, we're, no, we're, we're not just in the business of selling new cars. We're also selling used cars. And when you're looking at a used car, each one's a unique almost by definition. And we're, we're in the business of um, a very complex product with huge price, a, a huge selection in terms of if you, if you look at the manufacturers, different manufacturers, models, um, derivatives of those models. So we're in a marketplace of um, that is very complex, um, and we're also trying to. And we're still in, in, in the arena of negotiating the price of, of vehicles predominantly. So uh, in, in my mind, it's a very firm yes that at the moment we still need uh, uh, car salespeople. Now, what that might look like in another 10 years, personally, I think we still will. But I suppose you might say that cars become more of a commodity, uh, more, more like a mobile phone where people actually know what they want. And it's just a question of supply. But I think we're a good way away from that. What would you say, Jim? I, I think also, also there is this aspect that I think when we talk about car salesperson, I think it's how we define what selling actually is. And basically, it is this, this kind of con continuum between kind of selling through to facilitation. What is their actual role within this process? And I think it, uh, I agree with Ken that there is a need for a human interface within this actual process, but what the role is, I think, is changing, and it's how far that changes in different in different organisations will de be determined. But to how strong the online offering is, how much information the customer does in fact have, because I, I actually think sometimes the customer doesn't know what it doesn't know, which is a, an issue. So therefore, actually opening up a conversation with, with a customer may in fact lead them down a different route to what they actually came in in to do or actually transact. So I, I think it's what the, the role is, is more important than actually the, the fact that we do have somebody there. You know, it's what, what, what role is that being played? What do you think, Russell? I think just it builds upon those um, bits actually. I think what Ken says, uh, it's funny, I, I work with a mobile phone business and uh, that's interesting. I mean, I don't really do much in the automotive sector and I think what's interesting about that particular piece is that actually the operative word of car salesperson um, and it's there prim primarily as a sales driver and not as a, a point of you know, driving overall uh, satisfaction or facilitation. And I think it's interesting when you look at maybe someone like Carphone Warehouse and the tarnish that potentially went with that kind of territory versus how Apple repositioned itself as you know, a direct uh, manufacturer to consumer relationship that was built very much around building... Uh, kind of brand advocates, and the product came second to that. And I think that's going to be an interesting change in that relationship going forward. 
What do you think of um, companies like Rockar and the way that Ford have introduced their own product geniuses within store? Um, how do you think that works, for any of you? I think just building upon that last piece is, is, is the, car the, 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 the position of the car salesman has to fit within the environment that you're operating within. So I think just changing one component of it needs to match the rest of it. So have a look at Rock R, you know, and the Seat dealership in uh, Westfield in, in uh, you know, Shepherd's Bush is a good example. I think that's quite a nice take on the fact that it's trying to tackle some of those things that people, you know, no commission, no haggle. Um, it is very much taking some of those things uh, head on. I agree with Ken in terms of the fact that there's going to be some people that, you know, still want to talk to people. And actually that traditional relationship of having a conversation and potentially having that bartering conversation, you know, comes part and parcel with it. But um, I think there's, there's room for both right now. I, I think my, my take on it is that having you see customers come in, and it, it is this issue about do they actually know what is best for them? And sometimes you get a situation whereby somebody comes in with a mindset, they want this particular vehicle or they want this particular uh, model. And it, when it comes to it, when you start to unre you know, qualify it appropriately and understand what the customer actually requires from that particular vehicle, then you, you, you end up with a different solution. And you may have a different offering that is actually made than what they came in with. Unless you've actually got somebody who's actually informed and, uh, and is able to emotionally empath empathize with the uh, actual customer, then you don't get that quality of interaction. And that's really where I, I think the, there's a key role to play. I think it really comes into play when we're looking at um, emissions and like miles per gallon at the moment, um, and people needing to be well informed about what that car means for them. Are we at risk of almost um, mis-selling if we don't have these conversations and it coming back to haunt us later? I think there's a, a chance there, but if you don't speak to anybody, it's very different to miss But you know, there is actually a, 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 a fact. You know, but I think that there is a factor that if you act in the best interest of the customer, you put yourself in their shoes, then you get an understanding of where they're coming from, and that interaction is not something that you can necessarily do online. You can go so far online, but then you get to a position whereby that interaction, I think, is critical to the success from both points of view. Mm -hmm. That there is a win for the customer, but also a win for the uh, dealership. Do you have any thoughts on that, Ken? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you asked the question about Rockar. I mean, I think it's an interesting experiment. And I can see the, the upside, both from the, the cons consumer's point of view and, and, and the manufacturer's point of view in terms of creating... Um, it's, an, it's an easily low-pressure environment for customers to actually come and see the vehicles and talk to salespeople um, and get, get inquiries and ticks many boxes. But I do struggle with the... Um, the, the business model of that because uh, and I said with the previous um, presentation that um, it's just so expensive you, you look at the rent and rates of these these outlets for the for the cost of that rent and rates you could have a full-blown dealership and the issue is you probably need, still need that full-blown dealership um, so you know the the the, the, um, the rock car type business model think it's fine if the manufacturer is happy to subsidize it but I can't see dealers going down that route. Um, so to all of you again uh, do you think that great customer service can actually help dealerships sell more cars? Yeah I think I think it does. Um, it's, it's all about relationships isn't it and if you if you can build a relationship with a customer um, you're going to sell them cars. I think people are more promiscuous than they used to be in terms of, you know, when I was growing up, you know, people were either Ford man or they were Vauxhall man. Th these days, you've got rather more choice, and I think people will look at um, uh, a broader range of manufacturers. But I still still think there's an element of people who um, will just buy the Ford or the Vauxhall from the Ford dealer because they've got a relationship with that dealer, uh, and they will go back because, you know, they like the salesman, they like the the receptionist, they like something about the dealership. I think going back to your point, I think we're in a fragmented marketplace with lots of different options. And I think as a result of that, I think what's interesting, we were talking about this earlier, you know, in terms of the millennial positioning. And I think what's important is a relationship at the end of the day, whether that's a physical relationship or a digital relationship. 
the bit where I see the service element, of course customer service sells more cars. You know, that is, this is the same in every industry, but the key is, is what does service mean to that particular consumer? What does good customer service mean? And I think a lot of the time what I see at the moment is the fragmentation between online and offline. So that relationship should just morph all the way through rather than, you know, you know when you're having to repeat that conversation, I've already registered my details online and yet I'm having the same conversation with you again and again. And I think it's when you make that frictionless, that ability to be able to be quite seamless, that's the key. And I think at the moment, we haven't joined all the dots. No, I totally agree. You know, you've seen sometimes, you, you, if you check into a decent hotel, they will have pull, pulled up your LinkedIn page so that they know what your preferences are, they know your background, they know everything about you. You know, I'm, I am going to put on my LinkedIn page, I, I like champagne on arrival, you know, just in a vain hope that uh, something might happen as well in that area. But it's that type of thing whereby the you do find organizations that can do that, and you suddenly think, okay, fine, you're actually looking at it from my perspective. You've got information about me, you know, which is what you said about you know, putting stuff out on the line. If you've got that information already, then don't ask me again. And except, you know, exceptional customer service undoubtedly does sell more, because lousy customer service definitely doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so you know, it's a, I think it's relatively straightforward. Do you think we're more impatient as consumers generally? Because I know I get irritated by you give information and then you give it again, but purely because we're impatient and we think people should know everything about us. I think, I talk about this actually in my talk, in my workshop the last couple of days, and I think, I kind of akin it to the fact that seven years ago, Next launched Next Day Delivery, right? And we always like, wow, that's amazing, right? Next Day Delivery. And now we're like, uh, can I get it in two hours? And you look at Sainsbury's launching Chop Chop, 30 minutes delivery service. That need for instant gratification is here. And, you know, I was talking to a car dealer the other day, and those people that were at my workshop will know this, and the fact that the car dealer says to me, yeah, we've got a car available for you. It'll be six months. Yeah. Hang on a second. That's not instant gratification. And I think, how do you speed that up? And I think the question was, the, 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 the dealer came back and said, well, it's the manufacturer's rules. Oh, well, it's the, it's the process we go through. But then that process needs to change. Because that cycle is only going to get quicker. I, I totally agree. We, it's quite interesting at, at Loughborough, we have uh, students who fly in from the Middle East. So you get somebody from maybe Dubai, uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, and we say, okay, how long would you have to wait for a service there? And they say, well, 45 days. You come to the UK, and they will say, mm, maybe five days. But you then talk to Scania, and they go, 30 minutes. Yeah. You know, and the, what you've actually got is different market segments, different countries, different cultures, and availability is a big factor. And uh, I think you're looking and saying, well, what, what is the normal expectation if I need my car service? How long should I have to wait? And that's that mindset which says, you know, from next next day to two hours, and it's how that works. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, how we manage that expectation within customers will affect how they perceive the quality of service they're getting. Yeah, I, I think that I think digital is is changing our, our outlook on life in terms of you know the examples of Amazon uh, with a two hour two hour delivery. People are sort of come to expect as a consumer instant gratification um, yeah the, the, and, and, and that expectation will be um, seen with the, the local car dealer sometimes that can be satisfying sometimes it can't um, uh, but I think that's that's the direction we're heading at we're all getting more efficient in terms of how we we operate our business um, in, in terms of the processes that we, we, we run we need less people to to do the same job that we did ten years ago and that's not going to change and we will just have to get more efficient which will then bring a speedier service and I think technology can play a part in that so I think um, when you when you think about it you if you can't afford a 24-hour call center actually the ability to be able to have some sort of chat bot to have a conversation with that at least maybe alleviate some of those concerns or questions and I think you know you see more and more of that technology I mean there's a great app that uh, NHS has just released called Babylon and um, so that's in partnership with those guys. And whilst it's a different field, what it is, is most of the time you want to have a quick chat with the doctor to make sure you're not going to die today, right? So um, at which point you can have this conversation and the app recommends whether you see a GP or not. And then the GP appointment is available that day uh, via a video slot. So again, it's just changing that relationship, I think, is, is really important. So that relationship doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. It can be through different forms. So I was going to ask Ken, do you, have you put anything into place within your dealerships to improve customer service in like the last five years? Uh, yes, General, don't laugh at me, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'd like to think we have. <laughs> um, uh, we, what we, I meant is, have you had to change for the change in consumer, not just... <laughs> Well, well, I think the first stage is recognising that we need to do something about it. I think not too many years ago we just saw the CSI as a, 
it, it, it's, it's something the manufacturers made us do in boxes that we need to tick. And then the penny drops, well, actually, if you get your CSI right, you know, customers will, will, will actually like you. And we went through this thought process that, well, the starting point is to actually make the staff feel that they, um, they actually enjoyed coming to work for us. And once you got this, the situation of the staff enjoying working for you, there was a chance it might rub off on the customers. And, and that's, that's the process that we went through. And, and I think, it, it, on, the, on the whole, it's been successful. But you're never there. You, ne you never tick all the boxes all the time because we're dealing with human beings. So you just have to uh, make allowances. And it is interesting how customers perceive a visit to a dealership. You know, you, oh, going back over the history of this thing, you know, there used to be that um, a lot of people would uh, prefer to go to the dentist than go to a car dealership. And we did a lot of video research some years ago looking at people's anxiety in buying a car. Yet when they actually did the satisfaction survey at the end, it came out really high. They looked awful when they were going through the process. But actually, th when they came out, they were saying, oh, fantastic, really good. And it's really interesting. It's a bit like going to the dentist. When are you most satisfied with your dentist? Well, actually, when he says at the end, there's nothing to be done. And there's a sense of relief. Yeah. And it's almost sometimes that you get this whereby the, the actual experience in the past has been poor and people are just relieved to get through it. Yeah. And so that if we don't get efficient data at the end as to what the experience was actually about. So I think we, when we, we, we talk about the, it's what customers perceive as being quality service is the, the big issue. Yeah. How is that defined? How does that work for the individual customer? Which I think is a, a really critical issue. Because if you have low expectations and it comes out okay, then you're, you're pretty satisfied. <laughs> I'm not suggesting we should have an industry whereby we lower expectations, but it's, you know, it's a factor that comes into play when you measure it. And, and I think on the flip side, if you're, not, if you're not satisfied, that dissatisfaction is likely to have been there for a long period of time. The fact that you can now vocalize it just more you know, via social media platforms or by rating reviews, etc. I think it, it's always been there. Um, it's whether you choose to believe that it was there or not. So if you guys were going to give um, our delegates here today one piece of advice to take away or maybe one thing they should go and implement at their dealership to improve their customer service, what would that be? I say talk to the customers. Um, I, you see so many members of staff who are, who are customer shy. Um, you, you know, amazingly, you do see salesmen go in the opposite direction when they see a customer. And if, if all levels of management take the time and the trouble to actually talk to people, um, you, you, you build, start to build a relationship with the customer. And if, if, if the staff can see the senior management that's talking to the customers, there's a chance that they might start talking to customers. I would suggest go and buy a car. Because most of the people in our industry, in fact, don't buy cars. They, they actually either, either get one from the, the dealership or they get one from the manufacturer or in somehow there's a car scheme, etc. They don't actually have that experience on a regular basis. Once you've done it a few times, because as an academic, we have to buy our own. Yeah, we, once you've done it a few times, you, still, you soon start to see how the customer views the world, and it's quite an interesting experience. I think, uh, it, I think I'll just take a step back, actually. I think you know, we, we were in the era of big data, and I think we're now in the era of intelligence. And so I think there's too much data out there. I think the key is, is actually how do you put it all together? And I think if you think about it, the manufacturer's got details, the dealer's got details, the service provider's got details, the finance company's got details. And I think, you know, you've then got this, the secondary providers like the review sites, uh, like Trustpilot. You know, we were having a good conversation about this earlier. It's about how you put those pieces together to make some intelligent decisions about your business overall. Because I think there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, it's just we're not putting the pieces together to make some intelligent decisions. And one final question for me before we'll have to go. Um, we've talked about this a little bit earlier, that... Um, uh, some dealer groups have removed the commission structure within their dealership. Do you think that makes salespeople sell cars better? I'll start with you, Ken. Um, it's, been, it's been tried. We, we, we've never found it as so successful. Um, uh, you know, pragmatically, you've got to, uh, salespeople are, need incentive to, to close the deal. Um, otherwise, what you get is lots of long conversations with customers, but no, no deals closed. And at the end of the day, we need to sell. A f we need to deliver a few cars uh, to pay the mortgage. I must admit, I'm quite ambivalent about this because I think it, it, it does affect. If you've got an engaged workforce who have a bigger 
picture as opposed to their individual sales target. Maybe the profitability, that they're paid on profitability, a bit like John Lewis, that sort of idea. Then it takes away, it was interesting, Ken said about Rock Art being a low pressure environment. I'd like to think that our dealerships will actually become low pressure environments because the alternative is actually a high pressure environment where you've got fairly aggressive sales processes. So therefore, you know, from as a customer's point of view, I would like a low pressure environment. I'd like the salespeople to be remunerated effectively, but maybe it's on a bigger scale, maybe it's on a team scale over a longer period of time as opposed to the individual whereby you walk in and you get grabbed and then you're harangued for the next how long, you know, when they try and shift something that they haven't been able to shift for the last six months or six weeks and it's got to be shifted off the, uh, the forecourt. Uh, the, 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 I hope there's a few manufacturers listening to uh, what you just yeah, said, right. <laughs> because that, that's where it comes from when, the, manu when yeah. the manufacturer gives you some stretching targets that yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, they make your eyes water and you've got to deliver X number of cars in the quarter. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that's why, where the pressure comes from. I, I totally agree, Ken. I'm not <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it all comes down the chain, but you know, when it comes to it from the customer's point of view, it's just tough. You know, but I understand what you're saying. And I think that's the point, which is actually, is it from the customer's angle we're coming at this from? Or actually whether this is the, the, you know, the person that's got to make some money out of this? And I think it, it's interesting because you know, I'm, I'm probably, with Jim and Pat, you know, a bit ambivalent. I think you know, it works for both sides. Yeah. Um, I worked uh, on a project with Cunard, actually, um, when individual workers were tipped. Um, and what we did was remove those tips and work to a collective basis on the fact that as a, as a, as a ship, if we all perform together on the base, the shared values that we've got, then all customers should receive a better experience versus maybe just a select few. And I think what was interesting when we did that, there was a real lot of concern that we would see a dip, um, but actually as a result, as one big collective, we performed better. And I just wonder if there's that within a, in a sales environment, I'm not quite sure whether that translates, but it would be interesting to see whether, like you say, some of the experiments are out there, whether that, whether that translates across the period of time. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining me today. Um, I'm going to be back in about five minutes. We'll be talking about sourcing stock um, with my panellists hovering over there. Thank you.